uh, kind of like really soul gratifying film. So please check out Outfest Los Angeles. But we are here at Outfronts, uh, which is our television festival. And I'm really excited to have you all here for this panel. Uh, that is about queer firefighters. I'm, you were all here to see queer firefighters, correct? <laughs> uh, I should also say, if you are interested in Outfest, we have our membership table outside, so please go talk to uh, members of our amazing team. You can join as a member or you can volunteer. We really want to engage with each and every one of you with all of our programs. Um, but without further ado, I'm gonna start bringing out the people you actually came here to see. <laughs> Um, on uh, 911 Lone Star, I would like to first bring out Brian Michael Smith. Uh, Rafael L. Silver. Silva. Ronan Rubenstein. From Station 19 and 911, Tracy Toms. And we have the absolute honor of uh, inviting Assistant Chief of the LAFD, Los Angeles Fire Department, Katie Kepner. Hey. Woo. Yeah. Yeah. So, oops, sorry. <laughs> So my first question is kind of for the actors, how did you get involved with your shows? Did you, were you excited by being on a firefighting show? Had you ever been involved in anything around firefighting prior to being on your shows? And we'll kind of start with Brian. I actually hit the um, first responder trifecta with this show. Um, <laughs> I have played a lot of police officers. I played an EMT, and I really, really loved 911, the original show. And I was looking to do like a guest star role or something in that vein. So I was actually here at, at Noe House when I got the audition uh, notice for a series regular on this spinoff of 911. And I was just like, this is amazing. And as I kept reading the breakdown, it's like, trans firefighter, what? <laughs> you know, I, like, I'd never seen a first responder as a series regular that was trans. And I was like all about it, especially in this universe, because I'm such a big fan of the show. So I did like a traditional uh, audition for it. I went in, I read, and I thought... Uh, usually when you do the, the process for auditioning for a regular like this, you do an audition, then you do another audition, you do a chemistry read, you meet the producers. And I think that they were really trying to get this show going, that I did the one audition and then found out that I, I booked it. So it was, it was an amazing experience, and I was very excited to be involved. Very excited. Awesome. Uh, I had no idea what was happening, to be quite honest. <laughs> Um, when I, <laughs> when I, so, um, so I, I was living in New York, I was auditioning for plays, and I was up for a part for a play, and the day that I found out I did not get the part, I found out that I was coming out to test for Lone Star, and I was like, what? What is Lone Star? And then, uh, and then I came out to test, I auditioned, I have a chemistry read with, with this guy right here. Uh, and I think it went well, and then the next day I find out, uh, yeah, yeah, it did. Um, and then the next day I found out that I booked the show, the following week I started shooting. So to be quite honest, I mean it, I had no idea what was going on. Uh, and, uh, and I kind of started training as the show was going. We moved really fast. They were already shooting when I booked the show. So when it got to my scenes, we got to get the ball rolling in, and it all happened really fast. Uh, yeah, it was fun. It's been fun. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming out today. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, when you see an audition for first responder show, spinoff of a major hit like 911, you know, Angela Bassett, Peter Krauss, <laughs> <laughs> and then on top of everything, Ryan Murphy. You know, it's sort of like, where do I sign up? So, you know, I was very lucky. Had a couple auditions. Before I knew it, I was chemistry reading with Rob Lowe. That was nerve-wracking. Um, and then the next day, they're like, you're going to be on No One Lives There. And I was like, all right. And then we flew out to New York the, literally the next week and started shooting. And day one was uh, on a 50-floor uh, 50 skyscraper in Times Square with Rob Lowe, so I was like, all right, so this is how we're starting. The rest is gonna be easy, um, which it definitely wasn't. Um, and uh, yeah, that's sort of the journey, and um, 
Here we are now. Just got picked up for season four. Yeah. So yeah, it's a it's been a beautiful, beautiful journey. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll start with nine one one. So audition came in for nine one one to play the wife of a firefighter. So. I didn't know who I was the wife of because I had not seen the show yet. Um, but Aisha and I have known each other for a long time. So I get in the room and they're like, yeah, so you're the wife of you know, Henrietta. Um, that's Aisha. I'm like, Aisha Hines, is, turn the camera on. <laughs> turn the camera on. Turn the camera on. Let's go. Let's go. Let's do it. So I did it. Okay, great. And then I left. And it is so funny because it's so up my alley that when I parked and I was walking into the audition, there's another girl I always audition against, but she's very, very, like, girly girl pretty. And she saw me come, and she said, <laughs> she was like, I knew I read it, and I was like, this is a Tracy Toms part. I'm going to try to do it like Tracy Toms. I'm going to go in there and do my best Tracy Toms, and here you come, Tracy Toms. Ain't you busy? And I was like, no, sorry. I'm probably, and I was like, sorry, and my mom like, I'm probably gonna book it, but good luck to you. Um, because it's just, it, it was so like me, you know what I mean? And there are other roles I go in for, and she's there, and I'm like, why are you here? Because she's gonna book it, and then she books those. So it goes, you know, you have those people. Um, but then when I was leaving, I texted Aisha, and I said, so I just auditioned to, pl to play your wife. And she's like, oh, please, please, can you be my wife? Please be my wife, please. Will you be my wife? Can you be my wife? I'm like, I, I, I auditioned. I already auditioned for it, so yes, obviously I'll be your wife. Um, so then she called Tim Minear, and then next thing you know, I, I booked that one. Now with Station 19, uh, um, Krista Vernoff is a showrunner on that show. And one of my first jobs out of school, 20, not 20 years, almost 20 years ago, was Wonder Falls, and Krista was a writer on Wonder Falls. So since then, anytime she can get me in something, she does. So she texted me and was like, um, I have this role on Station 19. It's like the biggest guest star I've ever written. Um, will you do it? And I'm like, yes. And I didn't even know what it was. I was like, sure. And then we got the, and we got the dates in the script. And <laughs> people are like, oh, you're in 45 pages of this episode. I'm like, okay, so it must be like a hostage situation or something <laughs> where everybody's in the whole thing. Cause no, it's just you and one other actor every time. And I'm like, what? What am I doing? And I think like, you're the therapist. I'm like, oh my god. So I'm the therapist on Station 19 for the all the firefighters on that show. So it's very confusing to people I know that I'm on two firefighter shows with ones and nines in the title, but here I am. She's a doctor on both shows as well. And then Katie very different process of getting into the firefighting business. Um, you've been at the fire department for over 20 years. Um, how did you get started? Yes, well, I booked my role at age 24. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, I knew I wanted to do this since I was 15, 16 years old. I'm one of the lucky few that knew from a young age exactly what I wanted to do and was able to pursue my dream from that age. So I became an explorer. Uh, which is like a, a youth, a junior firefighter, and that's where I started learning about the tools, the equipment, uh, all of the procedures, policies, how much strength, physical strength you actually needed to have to become a firefighter. And I was able to gear everything I did from that point on towards getting my dream job. So going to school, I got my AA degree in fire science, I got my bachelor's degree um, I went to a private fire academy, I became an EMT, I did everything I could to build my resume to become the most highly qualified candidate for the job. Um, it took me seven years, I took my first test when I was 18, and it's such a competitive uh, career that it took me seven years, so I got hired when I was 24. I have 22 years on the job now, and every day I go to work, I'm smiling because it, it truly is my dream job. <laughs> What was training like? And then I will ask you all what your version of training was. It sounds like you kind of trained on the job. <laughs> A little bit. So what was training like for you? It's very extensive. Uh, for our academy in LA City, when I came on, it was a 20-week academy and uh, very physically and mentally exhaust exhausting. They uh, take you to almost your breaking point or to what you may think is your breaking point, so that they know you're mentally tough enough to get past that. Uh, not only is it 
physically challenging career, but we see a lot of things that other people don't. So they have to make sure that we're able to be healthy both physically and mentally and emotionally. So it's, uh, it's very extensive physically. I trained for a lot of years to be able to get through that academy, and it was still very tough, but well worth it, and it's, it's important. So. And then what was training like on the show? Because I know that you train alongside actual firefighters as well. Yeah, um, our first training was me, Ronan, and Natasha uh, Karam, who plays Marjan on the show. We went to Van Nuys and trained with some firefighters, um, led by Mike Bowman, who's our, one of our fire techs on the show. And uh, I, felt, <laughs> I felt like I'm, I'm real strong. You know, I got in pretty good shape for the L word. Um, and I'm like, let's, let's go. And like, we started to do just a little bit of the firefighter stuff. And this guy comes over and he picks up this thing and he hands it to me. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh, I see. These little gym muscles is not going to do it. I got to like step it up. So it was interesting to A, physically understand like just how different and the level of strength that you need to have to physically do the job. But then also just talking to them and spending the day with them and just sort of hearing how they deal with the things that come along, whether it's something very traumatic or even, you know, the, lots of downtime that they have in between things and, like, how you can be ready and stuff like that. That was something that was interesting to learn. And then um, for this season, um, Paul had um, some health issues, and so he had to redo the firefighter training, the CPAT test. And uh, just going through that, which is, I think it was um, eight or nine stations of different, like, physical activities that are directly related to the job, I had to, like, get, get ready for that, you know. And, I, again, it was one of those things where like, I felt I'm strong, I'm, I can do this, and I realized, woo. Wow, so that gave me a way deeper level of appreciation for the people who do this every day. You know, I'm really thankful for, for the, the commitment that they have for this job. Um, <clears throat> I feel like my training was a little bit different given that I play a police officer in the show. So um, it's really interesting. So yeah, just, just, just like what Brian said, I, you know, I grew up playing sports. I grew up being physically, you know, active, so that sort of, I thought I understood what that meant until I actually had to understand what police officers have to do on a daily basis. Uh, so training for that, one, and also, two, I think the journey, so as I said, I was, I was going, I, I learned on the job quite literally as we were shooting, as we were shooting um, scenes where I needed to be a police officer, but also a police officer not only not only in uniform, but in mind, in heart, and in the presence. Because, you know, I, I personally didn't grow up around firearms. I didn't know what they felt like. I didn't know what they sounded like, what they smelled like, what, how powerful that is, right? Um, that instrument that can, that can take a life. So re, as I was being trained by our tech advisor, uh, season one, Chick Daniels, um, I met up with him, and we sat down, and he told me, it's like, this is absolutely, you know, he didn't have to tell me this, but you have to say, this is not a toy. This is not something to just hold it without the dignity that it deserves, because it is a powerful uh, tool. So learning how to shoot, learning um, how to read, how to, how to read as in physicality of people, because when you're responding to a call, you don't know what you're walking into. You don't know if this is going to be the last day of your life, and that's right as a first responder. So... Um, getting into that mindset, it took a lot of reading. I, I read the Austin Police Manual, uh, which was like 700 pages. And, 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 and I, I only say that because there is a specific style of writing, which also helps in the way that police officers also talk. Um, so that was extremely helpful. Uh, I, I straight up went to YouTube as well. I watched, I watched thousands of hours of dash cam footage. Like also the the um, the body cam footage as well. I wanted to see what it felt like in the moment when 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 things hit the fan and it goes sideways. I want to know what that sounds like, what that smells like, what that what that looks like, and what that feels like. And it is uh, it, it it's a different world. Um, and in order to step into that uniform, you really have to respect their job. Um, and as an actor, I'm speaking specifically as an actor. Um, and, and yeah, it took a lot of emotional and mental, um, breakthroughs in order to really portray that respectfully. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so the first day was with Brian and Natasha, and um, it was cool because we actually got to go out on a, on a couple of uh, real-life calls and get to see sort of how they are in real time, and um, it was intense, man. But also there was sort of this, like, calm, cool, collected thing about them that, you know, it's just sort of another day on the job. Um, and I think the biggest thing that I took away was how calm they stayed, um, and, you know, it was very much like following protocol. And and then they went in, they came out, paramedics took over, and then we were in the truck within a couple of minutes. Um, so that was really cool to see because you, you don't really see that side of it. Um, and then I was very lucky to, uh, halfway through season two, TK got to become a paramedic. So my whole sort of education had to get flipped. And um, we have a med tech on set. Her name is Toby. She's actually sort of become my, like, on-set mom. Um, <laughs> And she teaches me every single day, especially when we have like really big medical rescues or, you know, we've 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 done some crazy stuff on the show, um, especially medically, you know, like saving a lady with a teapot on a plane <laughs> as it's going down. Um, so, you know, that's sort of something you have to learn on the fly. And, you know, a lot of the times our med tech is like, I've seen some of this in real life, and other times she's like, I've never seen any of this in real life, so we have to sort of adapt and figure out like how we would do it if it really happened. So a lot of it is learning on the go and staying on your toes, and um, yeah, it's really cool to be able to sort of learn about both sides of it, and um, it's cool that you're a paramedic from the fire department, <laughs> so um, yeah. And then, Tracy, your character on Station 19 is a former firefighter who's also there listening to the troubles of the firefighters at Station 19. So what was that kind of like to get into character? Because you're kind of, you are playing someone who's dealing with the duality of not being able to be a firefighter anymore, but also like counseling the people in that house. Well, yeah, it's the way that Krista writes. She writes, so she's always writing how I think anyway, which is how we became friends in the way that she calls me. She's like, you can learn this, it's fine. I'm like, it's four, it's four pages of me speaking. How? How? You know? <laughs> but what we ended up doing for that, uh, my first uh, episode, was we had rehearsals, which you never get. So we have rehearsals. So I was in the room with, like, Paris Barkley, who was the executive producer at the time, and, and Krista wasn't in the room. I don't think she was in the room with us. With a couple of producers, so I was in the room with them. And then one by one, the actors came in to rehearse, and it suddenly was like I was actually their therapist. So I was meeting these actors because I didn't know. I knew Jason George is the only one I knew before. So every actor came in. I could see exactly what they wanted to get out of the scene. It was very meta. It was very weird because I'm also like an acting coach, right? So so I coach acting as well. So they would come in and we start working on the scene. I'm like, okay, so she's going this way. Okay, cool. And then they would have a discussion with the producers. We're like, well, we're trying to get this out of this, trying to tell this aspect of the character because they don't get to do that at all. They're like, and the call and running and shooting and f flames and explosions and things like that. So this is the one episode where they got to actually just sit and talk about themselves. So it was a big deal for them. And I just wanted to provide a safe space for them to explore a different aspect of their characters because I knew it was really important to them um, in a way. So I was just, I was just uh, of service. And I felt very clearly, I, I'm here uh, to serve you, to help you explore this aspect of your character that you've never been able to do before, because I'm new. This is not actually about me at all. This is about you. But I ha got to do really great speeches because my character is a talking therapist, right? So she's like, let me tell you all about my life so you will now tell me about your life. So let's expedite this like trust thing because we're doing it because they lost a member of their team, which is why I was there as a therapist. So one of their team died. And I'm just like, okay. So I had this long speech about how I used to rappel down mountains and I was doing some kind of drop and I, my legs shattered and then my team had to then save me and, not, and couldn't save the dog. Like I hear the dog screaming in the house and I'm like, but, but save the dog. They're like, no, we have to save you now. I'm like, so that whole thing and how I, my character got over that was because my character had a therapist come and talk me out of a, the deepest, darkest hole that I'd ever been in. And then that's how I knew that I could still be of service as a firefighter. Um, so it was written, the way it was written was so clear. And all I had to kind of do was say the words and listen to the actors and support them um, in their journey on the show. And it just be, it was so rewarding to me because it felt like actual therapy. <laughs> we were actually in a session. And it was so funny, because I had just started my own therapy journey 
in my own personal life, again, I, I have bouts of therapy. Like, I went to therapy in college, and I went again after blah, blah, blah. You know, I had just started therapy again, so it was very, very meta, meta to me, and I was so honored that I get to play this character and, and help and help these actors and also help the characters and also help the audience. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a big deal to me. So we are a queer firefighters panel, so I'm going to ask some queer questions. <laughs> I wanted to ask, Katie, were you out to your house when you first joined your firehouse? No. Yes. No, I wasn't, actually. Um, to be honest, I wasn't out for many years in my career because I felt like I wanted to be known for my performance and my work ethic and not as the you know, lesbian or gay female firefighter, which there are a lot of, actually. <laughs> so it's not like I would have stood out. <laughs> but for me, I wasn't comfortable for a long time actually being out and inviting my partner to events and which was sad um, that I didn't get to experience that once I realized like I don't really care what other people think and I have proved myself and you know my performance speaks for itself <laughs> thank you thank you um, once I realized that yeah much uh, much happier both obviously in my personal life and at work um, and then uh your character has a coming out journey on the show as well, on uh, 911 Lone Star. So I wanted to know, because uh, Tarlos, everyone knows Tarlos and TK, and they're now engaged. No spoilers. <laughs> um, so what was that kind of like playing that on screen, I guess? Uh, wait, the, the relationship? <laughs> oh, no, 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 like the coming, the, the, like the starting the relationship off, I guess, on screen. Mm. Started off with a, hey, hey. <laughs> Wanna I dance? know, had the audacity to say that, didn't I? <laughs> Want to dance? Yeah. And I'm like, yep. Yep. <laughs> and the rest is history. No, but um, yeah, the writing, man, you know, it's like, it, it's, it's, it's how it all begins. It's the writing on the page. Um, we were really, really lucky. We had Ryan Murphy, Brad Falchik. Uh, and of course, Tim Minear, who's our showrunner. And, you know, they built these beautiful characters and then they built this beautiful relationship. And, you know, they clearly had big aspirations for the couple. Um, I don't know if they thought it was going to be this epic. So that's for, because of you guys. So thank you. Um, but, you know, it starts on the page and um, it's just a really honest, beautiful, complicated relationship. And, um, We've been through a lot in the show, you know, and as many of you know, we just got engaged. So to go from, hey, want to dance to will you marry me? Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful journey. And uh, yeah, it's I love Tarlos, man. <laughs> I love them so much. I, I, I look for that. As well, I've, I've said this in so many interviews, and I feel like I'm repeating myself, like I'm a broken record. So I'm going to do it again. Uh, um, I look for that as well in my personal life, in books, in films, in television. Where are the gays at? Like, where, where, where's the, where are the queer stories at? That's because that's this, this is my world. That's your world. That's your world, you know? And I think the, it's, it's so crazy to me that any story that any story being told does not include, first of all, a queer character, a queer character of color, or a person of color of a different background, because the the sun shines for all of us. If you go outside and you encounter someone with an umbrella and the sun is just hot on you, and they come up to you and they put that umbrella on top of you and they say, The sun doesn't like you, it doesn't belong to you, you just look at them like, what? Get, get away from me, bye, and then you continue walking. Because that light belongs to you, belongs to all of us. There's, there, there is space for all of us. You don't need to come to me with your umbrella and try to hide me, and put that shade on me. So for me, every story that is told needs to include that because that's just the world that we live in. And if that's not your reality, well, get out of the house. Go find that reality in which that world does exist. Don't discriminate because your ignorance is the leading part of your 
is the leading is the leading role in your storyline. You know what I'm saying? So I get to do that. I get to play that. So yeah, I'd sprinkle that stuff on that scene because I want to see that on screen as well. So yeah, I put the spice on it. <laughs> One of the things that I love about 911 Lone Star, just because I haven't seen it very often, is to see a trans firefighter on screen. So I wanted to A, say thank you for bringing Paul to life. But I was also like, when we were discussing putting this panel, you had also found there were, you were talking to other trans firefighters. So I wanted to know what that experience was like, preparing to be Paul and then speaking with other trans firefighters. Well, preparing to be Paul, I mean, I drew a lot from my own experiences just as a trans man and not seeing much trans masculine representation anywhere, period. Like, I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I, I went to school in Kent, Ohio, and, you know, felt very isolated for a long time because the only representation that I'd seen of any trans people had been, like, on screen. There's a lot of negative representation. We were only allowed to be, you know, like, the villains or the victims of something or, you know, the, the butt of a joke or something like that. Or, you know, and so I just, I knew I was different, but I didn't know that there was any other context for me. So, like, I'm just going to navigate this world being this different person that I am. So when I got to uh, college and I started to really confront these uh, challenges I was having with who I was and how, what the world was putting on me, I was looking for, there has to be, you know, some, something, something else like, there has to be a, a, a solution for me because I can't see a future for myself. You know, I remember I was in this acting class and I had a professor tell me after I brought a scene in that I couldn't do this, this role between like these two guys because no one's ever going to see you like that. Like you're a black woman and no one's ever going to see you. I was like, what? And I was like, this does, it doesn't feel true, but he's not wrong. And, and, I, and I, I just couldn't deal with that. And I'm like, well, how can I ever be me? And like, what future am I going to have for myself? And that's when I really like open my mind up to even like explore like and look for, are there other people like me? You know, I know there's male to female, but is there female to male? Does that even exist? And I, you know, went to Jeeves. I asked Jeeves because it was pre-Google. I'm old. <laughs> and, and like I came across, uh, you know, like uh, Jameson Green had a web page and it was he was promoting his book and he was a, a trans man. And he had transitioned, and like he's living his life as a man. He's using his voice and his experience to help other people. And he was a beacon of light for me, like from far away. And uh, when I was at Kent, I, I think by my senior year, uh, they were doing a, a pride issue of their like magazine. And I found that there was another trans guy in Ohio. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So just having that localized face-to-face -face meeting with another person like me gave me so much strength. And I'm like, I, I want to do that for other people. I don't know how just yet. I, I know I want to do it the performance, but that's what I want to do. And so that just kind of stayed inside of me for a long time. So as I got out of school, I graduated, I learned video and film production. I'm like, if they're not making it, I'm going to learn how to make it. So I learned the behind the scenes stuff in addition to the acting. And then when I moved to New York, I was working at the LGBT Center in Manhattan and I'm working with these young people and I'm like pushing them. I'm putting the wind in their sails. Like, don't let anybody stop you from what you, oh my God, I let somebody stop me from what I want to do. <laughs> I have to take my own advice. You know, I, and like what better way to do that than to show them by doing it myself. So I ended up uh, leaving the center and really pursuing my career in acting. I went very much like Katie, where I was like, I am going to become the best actor that I can be. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to get some training. I went to the William Esther Studio. I'm going to really learn how to act. And then I'm just going to, I'm going to act. And if a role comes up that allows me to explore this part of myself, I'll go for it. But I'm not walking in the door with it because I'm in a position of privilege where I have a choice on whether or not I disclose. And I want that choice to be meaningful, you know? And so it wasn't until 2017 when uh, I saw a breakdown for a role. I didn't even know what the project was, but it was like, we're looking for a black trans police officer. I'm like, I've played cops. I love like procedurals. <laughs> I'm black, I'm trans, what is this? And I submitted for it, and it was for Ava DuVernay's Queen Sugar. And I'm like, this is, I wanted to work with Ava for years. So, um, and I read the scene, and I was like, this is it. This is what I've been looking for. It's gonna allow me to be fully authentic and show a side of the black trans masculine experience that people don't get to see. And it was this scene between me and a former friend, and I'm expressing gratitude for him for being an ally. And even though he wasn't a perfect ally, he didn't know anything about it. He just stood up for me when I was in school, uh, in high school at the time. And I'm, re I'm meeting him in this point in his life, and he needs help. And I'm in a place where I'm sturdy, and I'm on my feet, and I'm so embodied in who I am as a person that I'm giving him advice. So it was a really beautiful like, scene to show like, how much life there is beyond transition and coming out and all this stuff. It's like, here's this fully embodied 
black trans man giving this black man some man-to-man -man advice and expressing gratitude, and it was like it was beautiful. So it was it allowed me to do that, and then since then, the response bec because it hadn't been seen before has been so overwhelmingly positive. Like, I was ready for, like, here comes the hate, here comes this, and, like, there's some of that sprinkled in here, and I know a lot of people experience, experience that, you know, I don't want to dismiss that, but, like, for some reason at this moment in my life and when I came out, you know, um, with uh, Queen Sugar, the response has been real-world people going, thank you for being visible. I didn't know that I could. I didn't know that I had a future, and it, would, it always takes me back to college when I, I felt the same way, and I came across Jameson Green. Where I, I, thank you, you know? I actually got to meet him. Uh, a couple summers ago at this camp, I, and I got to say that to his face, which was a really beautiful thing to say thank you for like putting your story in the pages. And I want to do that, not just with my own personal Brian story, but as an actor, as an artist, I can do things that I didn't experience, you know, yet, and like take bigger stories and reach more people. You know, I love that this show is on like Fox because it goes into the middle of America to people who you know, are under the shade, who are under the umbrella, and just, you know, whether by choice or whatever, that's just where they were born, they're under, they don't even know they're under the umbrella. But here I am coming into your living room and saying, ha ha, yeah, we out here, and we're doing these things, and I'm, we're not whatever some other person has told you we are. I'm going to show you, you know, iterations of, of who and what trans masculinity can be that you don't know that you don't know. Thank you. Um, and then, Tracy, one of the things I really enjoy about seeing on 911 is seeing kind of the relationship of someone who's in a fire department and then their partner. Again, to see the journey that they go through on screen when one person doesn't actually work in the same field. Your character's a rocket scientist, so it's not like, you know, you're no slouch in that particular relationship with Han. <laughs> no, I pull my weight. I pull my weight. But I, I wanted in a nice to... House. <laughs> But one of the things I really enjoy about watching uh, that on screen is kind of just seeing just how much that person's also involved like with engaging with the fire department because it's essentially a family. And I think one of the things that's really great about all the firefighter shows, and there's going to be a firefighter show in every major network um, in the fall, um, and each one of them has a queer character, which is phenomenal. Um, <laughs> thank the networks, I guess. <laughs> um, so I kind of wanted to know like what went into playing Karen a bit, like how... You, you, you said that you already know Aisha, which is great, but like, what is it like kind of like interacting with your character, especially when they interact with the rest of the fire department? Well, it's, it's interesting because Aisha and I have known each other for about 20 years, um, and both of us happen to be straight, hetero, whatever that, you know. Um, we happen to be hetero, but we both have an extensive career of playing queer characters, and we are both so grateful to have the opportunity to represent the community as well as we can. And, and we're also very grateful that the community has accepted us um, as part of the family, if you will. So the ease with which we work together is, uh, is beautiful because it's like it's kind of built in because we've known each other for so long. Um, but we also have a very strong sense of our responsibility to show this loving, supportive, black queer couple on TV, because there aren't a lot of them. You know, there are a lot of queer couples on TV that are interracial, for example. There's, you know, it was a white woman and a, and a black woman, or, um, but, but the fact that we're both black, we're both queer, we're both out, we're both proud, we're both having a, a beautiful family situation. You know, we have children, we have one son and we're fostering other children and all of those things that queer couples go through. You know, we want to have a kid. Okay, well, who's going to carry? Okay, well, we're going to do that. We're going to do this in vitro situation and all that stuff that people deal with um, and show all the ugly parts of that and all the beautiful sides of that. And, and because we're just there for each other and we have very um, a high comfort level with each other, um, I think it's so important. And people walk up to me on the street, they will just call me Karen. They're like, oh my God, it's Karen. And I'm like, <laughs> um, and, and I love it because they, they see themselves um, and they see their partners and their partnerships. And now, you know, on the season finale, just now we had a vow renewal, so we had a big wedding and it was really, really beautiful. And then Aisha went off and had an actual wedding and and broke the internet with her wedding photos, but that's another story. Um, uh, but yeah, but it's just such an honor. It's, it's, it's really, it's such an honor to me to be able to play Karen because, you know, Ryan Murphy shows, they just get into it, you know, they get into the nitty gritty of it. Um, and, you know, like we, we even explore, like, I didn't even know that um, there's, a, there's a phenomenon that happens with lesbian couples where after a while, they, they start to feel like roommates. 
you know what I mean? It was called lesbian bed death or something. I didn't know this was a thing. I didn't know this was a thing. It was like, well, if we're not having sex, then what are we doing? Are we just roommates? Are we just like besties? We're just going to do our nails? What are we doing? You know, and exploring that phenomenon that I didn't even know existed and was a real thing, but it's a real thing. And I'm learning every day about new aspects of these relationships. And, um, and I'm just, I'm happy to be open. I'm happy to listen. I'm happy to support. I'm happy to be an ally as, as well as I can be. And I'm happy to ask questions. I'm happy to be wrong. Um, and, and yeah. So I'm just, I'm just grateful. I'm just very grateful. One of the things you all kind of touched on is like the importance of like seeing that representation or being that representation. One of the things that I was very excited by um, when I was putting together this panel, because it was like this thing in my head, because I watch a lot of TV um, and I watch, and there's really so many firefighter shows, was I really wanted to make sure that we had representation of a queer firefighter in real life. Because it's really great to see it on screen, but it's, I wondered if it existed. And I was just so happy to find Katie and also the actual, the, the like, so Katie's the assistant chief, and the fire chief of the LA Fire Department is also queer in Los Angeles, which is absolutely amazing. <laughs> and you talked a little bit about your journey, but I kind of think that like having you in that position must also result in a lot of people feeling more comfortable being out in their firehouses. So I kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit about like some of your experience working with other firefighters. Yeah, definitely. I have uh, had the opportunity to uh, mentor many young women and men, both on our job. Um, it is easier for women to be out in the fire department uh, for some reason. I mean, I think it is still, it's very much a male-dominated field, and we all live together in the fire station. So unfortunately, um, there are not a lot of male uh, firefighters who are out who so on our job for example we have 3,500 members and there's truly only two men that are out as gay wow. in our department so that part is sad and our new fire chief is definitely working on changing that culture so that everybody feels safe in the work environment to be who they are because truly when that happens we are able to better serve the communities that we're in. So for me, like I said, I've had the opportunity to mentor uh, many young women and men, and I always tell them, uh, be yourselves, be who you are, um, because that's going to make you a better firefighter if you feel comfortable being who you are at work. Um, and it's a career of service where we can, we, we have the opportunity to provide a compassion and a caring to the people that we work with and that we serve to help them feel comfortable. So I, I always say that and try to portray that to young firefighters coming on the job and, and hope that I can be part of the culture change to make our in, work environment more equitable and inclusive. I have something to add to that. It's it, what, switching gears to Station 19. What I what I will say about Shonda Land is they're also very inclusive as well, and they're always pushing that needle. And as the therapist, I got to do a session with the queer character on that show and talking about coming out and, and being who he is and how he's always been out but how he judges other people for not being out and how like we need more representation in the fire in the in the fire stations because he's like the only out person in the Seattle fire department. Um, on the show, so you know, just talking him through that, and there's a there's a queer woman who's the, who was the captain at one point, and I talked to her about being open to being loved and and expressing love to the person she loves, and and I'm just so grateful to be a part of that as well, pushing that narrative forward, and how it's important to be yourself, and it's important to give people space and time to come out on their own, but to provide space for them to feel safe to do so. So it's so awesome that you're doing that in real life. That's amazing. Thank you. Uh, so my next set of questions are more of the fun side. So you were a consultant on Station 19. So how well do the shows do the firehouses? <laughs> I think they're, they're doing a much better job nowadays than in the past, for sure. Uh, especially with the types of incidents that we go on, a lot of the camaraderie. Um, there is drama in the fire stations in real life, not quite at the level of the drama <laughs> they portray on the shows, which is always not quite. <laughs> always fun to watch. Like I know, you know, they they share locker rooms in 
some of the scenes, and that doesn't happen. <laughs> um, they share other things in some of the scenes, and <laughs> that doesn't often have to happen either. <laughs> um, but I think they're doing a really good job of being realistic to what we experience in our career, uh, just maybe pumped up. It's like a 2.0 level. <laughs> but uh, they are doing a good job, and I really enjoy being able to consult on that show every once in a while. The, the technical advisor is one of our old fire chiefs, and he kind of brought me on board. So I love that they, they really do listen to me and us on, on what it's like and how we live it in real life to be able to portray that as the actors, and I really appreciate that. And I believe the advisor on 911 Lone Star is also one of the firefighters in your department. Right? Yes, he's also a, an ex-chief from the LEFD as well. Awesome. Ooh, oh, that's someone had their hand up. Um, my next, uh, I guess my next one is more of a, because we are getting towards the end of our time together. Um, but I wanted to check first, uh, what's kind of some of the wildest things you've had to do on the show? And then what is the wildest call you've had to do in real life? This is tricky because there's a lot of wild stuff. No, there is. <laughs> like, oh, man. Um, I don't know, like, just wild in general, but just sometimes, like, as an actor, when, like, I've, I've come from, you know, basements of Brooklyn, like, black box theater. So to go from that to, like, Disney Ranch and, you know, uh, upside down airplane smoking and, like, you just see, you understand, like, oh, this is how you spend $200 million on something, you know what I mean? Because they go all out. So the sandstorm was something that was just, like, so crazy to be a part of, you know, when that we did the elevator with the fire and we're pulling the people out. So, I mean, just in terms of, for me, the scale of the things that we do sometimes. Even the, the finale we just did uh, with the collapsed building, and I'm, like, up on this aerial ladder, like, 50 feet in the air, and I'm looking down, and it looks like a real like scene and just how many people, like 350 people plus committed to making this look as real as, as possible. It, 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 that's wild to me sometimes, for sure. Um, I think for me, the, yeah, the show, I'm, I, as I was listening, I was like, what is the craziest? Because, <laughs> you know, a plane falling is like, oh, it's a day's work. You know, that's normal. And so, but I think for Carlos specifically, because he's not included necessarily all the time with the, with the 126, I would say the, the snowstorm, uh, as I was carrying that man out of the building and all the walls started to come down. So first of all, let's, let's just get this thing straight. Uh, the scene before when I, so... <laughs> Uh, I was so the same. So this, what happens is the the roof of the building of the church is collapsing because the snow the snow is you know it's just it's too heavy and so it's putting pressure and so uh, as we're rehearsing for that scene the the entire the, everyone on production is on set and the director Brad Beaker comes up to me and says can you lift this man and I was like okay because the actor uh, that was playing he um, he was also disabled and so I said well it would be look more real if I was actually carrying him out so why don't I do it so you suggested it I suggested it yeah 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 I suggested it <laughs> and so um, <laughs> getting it straight here um, and so I did know that the pants were so tight uh, during rehearsal, so as soon as I bent down, well, guess what? Whoop! That thing just split in half. I just showed everyone my neon orange underwear. Nothing like that the, three the, the Ryan Murphy fit of uh, pants. The Ryan Murphy pants. We want to see them. Yeah. Um, so, but he, <laughs> so so there was that rehearsal, and I was like, oh god, I'm, I flashed people like five times with my uh, neon orange underwear. Um, but then leading up to the scene where the building actually collapses. Um, rehearsing for that was very technical because we could do it only once. Only once. Four walls and an entire ceiling falling down. So we rehearsed it, rehearsed it, rehearsed it. And then when we were ready, I kind of went to shit because there was a line and I almost tripped with the actor in my hands. So I was carrying this man and then there was snow falling all over my face and I couldn't see a thing. Cameras was right in front of me and I'm tripping over things. And they were like, all right, do we think we got it? Yeah, I think we got it. They were like, yeah, we think we got it. And I was like, can we do one more? And we needed to break for lunch and we needed to break for lunch because then if we don't, then we break some rules, you know, some SAG rules. Um, and, and so, we broke for lunch and then we did it again. 
with all those falling walls and everything and uh, with that actor in my hands. And But that was a lot of fun. It looked real because it was real because those things were falling. So <laughs> that was the, I'd say that was the fun, crazy thing that Carlos has done. I got a couple. I'm, there's probably a couple as a firefighter and a couple as a paramedic that stand out. I think the first one was at the end of season one, the finale. There's a, a bus that gets flipped upside down, and there's a lady that's jammed. It was the bus driver. The bus begins to fill up with water, so I have to perform underwater CPR, which you can't fake it. You got to do the real thing. And while all that is happening... The bus catches fire, so I have flames breathing down on my back, and that's real. So the bus is starting to fill up with water. This actor and I are underwater doing uh, CPR. The flames are super hot, and then the bus starts filling up with gas and smoke, and that was not fun to do at all. And <laughs> that actress was such a trooper, and we shot that for hours and hours and hours, and uh, we, we did it. Um, and then probably the grain silo was crazy when I go in after Marjan, and that's real. You know, a lot of it is practical. That's what's so cool about the show, and diving headfirst into grain silo and not knowing where the exit is, and you sort of just, like, close your eyes and you pop out. Um, but I think as a medical, the craziest thing was um, during the snowstorm, the three of us are huddled in this tiny station wagon, and I'm in the process of developing severe hypothermia. <laughs> so I'm soaked and shivering, and um, we have to pretty much warm up the blood of this young boy with this crazy fancy machine. And we're doing all this really intricate passing back and forth of tools, and um, that's all pretty much real. And just shivering uncontrollably for like 12 hours will give you quite the, uh, quite the migraine. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, TK's been through some shit. I thought you were gonna, I thought you were gonna say the teapot, and then I was like, oh no, we're going another direction. The teapot, direction. actually, to be completely honest, the mechanics of it seem complex, but once you put the teapot in, it's just you know, it's a really beautiful dramatic scene um, uh, with um, with Genevieve. That's her name. Um, but the actual mechanics are pretty simple. Um, I think just physically shivering and then all the tools with Gina Torres that that stuff was crazy and also a station wagon you know it's like so uncomfortable and your knees are all destroyed by the end of the day and um, yeah <laughs> we definitely put our bodies through it for sure yeah I don't get to do the fun stuff <laughs> I will say I've never had to deal with a snowstorm, <laughs> a sandstorm, a sharknado, none of that, um, for those of you that remember that movie. Um, and when you say wildest call, um, that could mean so many things. <laughs> well, yeah, no, it could be, I mean, on, I know on 911 they had, like, a person covered in spider webs at one point, like, had been, so, like, it doesn't have to be, like, the yeah. most figured, like, physically hard, like, what's, like... Yeah. I think the call that would be surprising. A surprising call. Well, we've had people stuck in precarious situations and things stuck on people in precarious <laughs> situations, which are always unique and interesting for us to be innovative in how to get them out or things off. So, you know, I don't want to go too much in detail, but there, there have been um, incidents where cars are hanging off the side of a, of a cliff or a freeway where they are going to fall, and we have to get people out before they do. So those are always high-stress, uh, critical incidents that we look at afterwards and go, wow, uh, we did it. <laughs> Thank God. And um, a lot of, you know, just traffic accidents or fires where we do pull people out, and you don't think about it while you're doing it, but afterwards, really, it's when you take a moment and and realize how lucky are we that we get to do this job through some of the craziest times of their lives. And we get to come on scene, our training kicks in, like you talked about earlier. We, we don't think about it, we just do it, and then later on take a breath and say, 
wow, how lucky are we to be able to do this? I gotta add, Brian. Remember when we were doing the lava bombs at the at the frat party, <laughs> yes. and they're literally throwing, throwing like flaming, flaming balls rocks at, at us, us, and we're like <laughs> evading them. And then at one point, we like try to pull this dude out of a pool, which is pretty much boiling, mm-hmm. and all of his, his skin peels off oh, his yeah. arm. And we the learned some are things. So like, realistic, yeah. man. It's we like, learned that word degloving, and I'm like, you know, there's uh, terms I wish I could just go through my life and never <laughs> like know, and that is definitely one of them. Yeah, it's some gnarly stuff, man. Well, I want to thank you all for coming here and sharing your amazing stories, but also just like being yourselves on screen, because I really do think, um, I'm, I work for a queer filmmaking space, so like this makes the most, but like seeing things, seeing versions of yourself on screen, seeing it in real life is really how we change the world. To be able to tell your story authentically, or to just see someone live a life that you don't know that you necessarily can do, but like actually get the opportunity to. And I want to thank each and every one of you because you all do it in a different way. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for putting this together. All right, and thank you all for coming. Um, you, If you would like, you can stay for the next panel, which is at five, in which we are going to have the cast and uh, contestants from Legendary. But I just want to say thank you all for coming out.